Hello, my name is Tom Wilson. I am the uh, one of the priests here at All Saints Episcopal Church. Uh, and this is the sermon that is going to be given on July 20th, 2014. Uh, we're using the Genesis uh, uh, 28, 10 through 19. That's the um, Jacob's Ladder story. Uh, Psalm 139, 1 through 11 and uh, 22 through 23. Uh, Romans 8, uh, 12 through 25 and Matthew 13, uh, 24, 30 to 30, and 36 to 43. Uh, this is the second part of a trilogy that I, I did. Um, well, I, I, a tetralogy I did. I mean, last month I did a trilogy, a three-part series on Reflections of Abraham, and this month I'm continuing with a tetralogy, a four-part series on Jacob. And we started last week with Esau's despising of his birthright. And, and I mentioned the archetype of the hero's journey, the, the mythic journey that each of us takes in order to move uh, beyond um, or towards becoming a full human being. It can be a journey outward, but the, the point is not geography. It is rather the, the journey inward into the soul, the sacred place where the, the divine meets us. Uh, Gail Goodwin, Godwin, in the finishing school, uh, has a character offer this advice. And it goes, these are two kinds of people she wants to decreed to me emphatically. Um, one kind you can just tell by looking at them at what point they congealed into their final selves. It might be a, a very nice self, but you know you can expect no more surprises from it. Whereas the other keep moving, changing, they're, they're fluid. They, they keep moving forward and making new trysts with life. And the motion of it keeps them young. In my opinion, they are the only ones who are still alive. You must be constantly on your guard, Justin, against congealing. Jacob is on his way to changing. In today's lesson, Jacob has to leave town fast. He has, with the connivance of his mother, Rebecca, lied to and swindled his father and has stolen the blessing and birthright of his brother, Esau. Esau is much bigger and stronger than, than Mama Boy's Jacob is looking for his trickster brother in order to kill him. And Rebecca packs Jacob up and sends him to her brother Laban's land for safety. Jacob is on the run, and there is no one who can help him. He knows that he's all alone. And Jacob is rotten and no good, and he's responsible for whatever will befall him when Esau catches up with him. His life is out of control. For those of you familiar with the 12-step recovery program, step one is we admitted we were powerless over what is that what it is that is lousing our, up our lives. And our lives have become unmanageable. Recovery begins only when you realize that life is out of control. And Jacob is stuck in the pre-step one. He is trying a geographical solution to his addiction to manipulation. And when he comes to this deserted place, it's beginning to dawn on him that he's up Gingite Creek without a paddle. He cannot use his favorite crutch manipulation. Not knowing what else to do, he goes to sleep in hopes that his dreams might tell, give him an out. Now, come on, on, don't roll your eyes at me. You knew I was going to look at the dream. Jacob has not been conspicuously religious so far in the story, so we're not surprised when he does not say his prayers before he goes to sleep. He's not thankful for the day that's just ended because he attributes it to luck leaving before Esau caught wind of his scheme. He's not looking for God, because he's still dependent on his own cleverness. In this mindset, when you're clever and lucky so far, why do you need God? Jacob had to flee from Beersheba, and he has no time to pack anything, so there's, there are no soft things to use as a pillow. And the storyteller makes a point of the fact that he uses stones for a pillow as a way to tell us how desperate a regular person would be, except Jacob is a good example of a person being in denial. He's not ready to face the full reality of who he can become. So he goes to sleep with a clear conscience because the nagging conscience 
has been repressed to the unconscious. Now, if this were a tale of morality, we might expect the dream where the unconscious presents a condemnation story full of gloom, guilt, and punishment. However, the dream that comes is one of support by God. As the sower of the parable from Matthew in today's gospel lesson suggests, it's not yet time for the condemnation of Jacob's actions. As it, when it says, no, for in gathering the weeds, you might uproot, uproot the wheat from with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. So there is still time for Jacob to grow and change. As we do in our dream groups, I might say, if this were my dream. So, in my dream, I hear God saying that God is patient. And God has all eternity. And will not push me. Only invite, invite me. I will need to do some changing. For as Lao Tzu says, uh, God's messengers come in all different forms. In the Tao uh, Te Ching he who stands on his tiptoes does not stand firm. He who stretches his legs does not walk easily. So he who displays himself does not shine. He who asserts his own views is not distinguished. He who vaults himself does not find his merit acknowledged. He who is self-conceited has no superiority allowed to him. In Jacob's dream, there is a ladder which reaches from where Jacob is sleeping all the way to heaven. Now, if this was a moral uplift story, we would expect Jacob to make the long trap one wreck, one rung at a time up that painful, laborious ladder before he's able to come into the presence of God. However, in this dream, God is here on earth, standing next to Jacob. The message is that God is telling Jacob that God is with him and will go wherever he goes, and will continue to bless him, even if he had obtained those blessings under false pretenses. God says in this dream, For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. God is telling Jacob that God is not finished with Jacob yet. In my dream, I hear God saying to me that God is faithful, even when I am not. God has a birthright, a blessing, which is still in the process of unfolding each day. God is walking with me, standing with me, even when I'm too busy with my own agenda to notice God. In Jacob's dream, God does not climb down the ladder. Jacob does not climb up the ladder. The ladder, the connectedness to God, is maintained by the constant stream of angels. And remember that angels are seen as messengers of God. And God is constantly speaking to us. Jacob, through all of creation, when we are awake and in our dreams, when we are asleep. When I claim this dream as my own, for all of these stories are part of our inheritance, I would say, in my dream, the divine within my soul is saying that I am loved. And to use the line from Paul's letter to the Romans for today, you've received the spirit of adoption. And when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. I hear that I am an inheritor of God's spirit. It is a blessing, a birthright, even if I don't appreciate it when I first received it. In Jacob's dream, he wakes up and he misses the point. He's terrified and takes the stone used as pillows and makes a pillar of them, anoints it with oil and calls it Bethel, which means the house of God, an entrance to heaven. And he leaves as fast as he can. He makes the assumption that God dwells only in this place, and he wants to separate himself from this spiritual nature so he can go on with life as he defines it. In my dream, I would be tempted to leave the message from God in my unconscious 
because it calls me to become more fully aware that God is with me wherever I go and whatever I do. When I finish the course on dream group leader training, one of the things they'll give me is a plaque of a translation of a Latin saying, which Carl Jung hung as a sign over the entrance to his house. Vocates at, atque non vocates, Deus ataret. Bidden or not bidden, God is here. One of Jung's followers, uh, Marie-Louise von Franz, wrote, It seems to me that one of the greatest contributions of Jung and his work is, the, is that it taught us to keep our door open to the unknown stranger. On our journeys, awake or asleep, I suggest we keep the door open to the unknown visitor who is at the center of our soul. God bless.